Um, my name is Vincent Batts. I've been in a couple of different open source projects over the years. Um, for the last couple of years, it's been mostly uh, getting gray hairs because of the drama in the container community. Um, so that has been being a Docker contributor and then trying to remove myself from the Docker community for a few years. Um, but containers have been interesting and fun, uh, mostly a headache to a lot of people and how they use them. Um, they, they do try and make a concise approach and it has gotten people thinking about how to deploy apps differently. Uh, LXC did a great job in the beginning, but it was not for mere mortals and we've gone a long way since how people were using LXC. Um, and it's neat and I'm ready to ask the Facebook folks more questions about how they're using portable services. Uh, to make sure that we can keep some more of a cohesive story going forward. Um, but I didn't put the, the timestamp up there, but the original containers were a Google patch for Mount Namespace in like 2002 or three, I think. Uh, and Shroot plus some of those rudimentary name, like early namespaces was the beginning of that. Um, and so LXC came along and first first commit, first release, I mean not first commit, first full-on release of LXC was in 2008. Um, so it had been around for a while, like people were already using containers in a number of different ways. Um, I thought it was interesting that even system D Hello, hello. Okay, uh, so probably like literally 5% of the room raised their hand just then. Um, how many folks currently or have had experience with LXC? So substantial more folks. Is that current or is that just history? History, yeah. Um, so it's interesting, but so system D and spawn was originally like, Leonard was, was like protesting that it would be anything besides a debugging tool uh, for years. And it wasn't really until some of the other tools started to get exciting that it he, it, he made it more of a um, user interface, like added features, made it more of a system utility, uh, plugged in machine CTL and other plumbing pieces to make it more fully rounded. Um, when Docker came onto the scene in 2013, it was originally Python, um, and then Go was cool, so it switched over to the Golang. Um, not always a great option for containers at all. Um, and I would, uh, I shared the link earlier, and uh, you can look at this later. Most of these have links to find this, these, these pieces. This slide deck is mostly uh, almost like reference material to click out and find, because some of these pieces are projects you might want to go put your hands on and or explore in how you could integrate or reuse some of this stuff. Um, but there's no links to Docker here because there is no longer one, there's no longer a good thing to sing, a single project to link to for Docker um, because it has been so torn apart and put into different projects. Part of it are in Mobi, part of it are split out. Um, there's no single one link to follow to for that. Um, anyhow. Other pieces in history, how many people had put their hands on, let me container that for you? LMCTFY. Cool, like two people. So it came out literally around the same time as Docker. It was a lot of the same folks that were early maintainers, Victor Marmol, uh, Vishnu um, from Google. But it was kind of thrown over the wall of like how they were using containers. One of the cool thing precedents that it had and still is a good use case for is it was not focused nearly as much on the user interface. It was meant to be almost like what Run C has become now, 
is that last mile step with all the knobs and whistles like you could you could actually set lots of secret parameters and lots of fine tuning pieces of the last mile rather than presenting just a unified pretty user interface um, and it's funny that we've almost gone full circle on what they've done there of like pushing it down to where you have a very fine tuned last mile with lots of bell like lot, lots of knobs to turn um, and it's still out there. I don't think it's had a touch in four or five years. Um, so Rocket came along in December 2014. Um, a lot of the tensions that were happening during this time, uh, between mid-2013 to the end of 2014, was how fast and, to some extent, footloose the development was happening within Docker community. Um, that there was a lot of contention around how and what was the design that went into features that were getting merged. How did we arrive at any kind of a consensus for how those features were going to be used? Um, so with Rocket, we went with a spec first development, and that spec was the AppC spec. How many folks got familiarized with AppC at all? <laughs> yeah, Derek, of course. So like maybe about five percent of the room. It was great because it was released as a as a full spec as as an approach that could be taken, and it provided a reference implementation at the same time. Uh, any changes that would happen in Rocket would be debated in AppC first, um, and almost within like months of the spec coming out, uh, there was like a free BSD implementation, and folks started working on other derivatives. Uh, somebody changed out like the stage two and made like a VM runtime. It was a lot of what we hoped to see uh, happen synthetically, but it happened because there was a spec first. Um, Rocket is still used in places, but is largely put out to pasture. Um, there's some community maintainers, but you can go find it on GitHub Rocket or RKT, RKT. Uh, LibCT. So this, this project got a lot of attention in a short order. It's not actually any user interface. It's a C library, and there's a Golang wrapper around that C library. But it came from the Otis op OpenBZ folks. And uh, Andre Vagin and Pavel are crazy people. They're, they really have done awesome stuff for the container community, both in the, in the kernel and also in the user space. Uh, they're the maintainers of like CRIU, the checkpoint and restore in user space. Um, there's a lot of neat features that are thanks to them, but this was a neat proof of concept to try and push back the abstractions from the, con from the command line into like a library that could just be reused in other ways. Uh, I think it's effectively a dead project now. I don't think it has had commits in years, or at least not pushed publicly. Um, but around that same time, it generated the conversations for what Docker was going through of everything was shelling out to different last mile runtimes for Docker during this time. The primary backend was LXC. Like, so you'd run Docker run something and it would actually shell out to LXC commands to do that. Um, and there was Shroot, and I don't know if there was another one at that point. I don't know, the LXC was the primary one. So they were trying to figure out how could we have a, minimize some of those steps or shelling out. And <laughs> it was funny because they actually asked a lot of the LXC community for features to improve that, that communication between the two. And right around the time the LXC community was looking to add those features to make it a better workflow for reusability, they started pushing the code into a direct invocation so that uh, the Docker daemon would just shell, or not shell, but would effectively call all the way down. It was all one big binary. It would actually re-exec itself. And they started libcontainer, kind of in the likeness of libct, to have a, a, a source code ABI, uh, API to be able to call down to the runtime. Uh, at that time, what was it? NS, not NS Enter. NS init was, was like, we made a, a command line that would use that lib container to test out that last mile. Uh, that's what became run C that you hear folks talk about today. Um, so yeah, 
that that was not well received within the LXE community that <laughs> there was asks for something that they started to deliver and then immediately was switched away over to libcontainer to just wholly rewrite it them you know and not use LXE uh, LXE was actually removed around or within 2014 um, so the LXE community split split off and made a manager over LXC called LXD. How many folks here have put hands on LXD? Cool, probably about five or ten percent. Um, and it is a, a live and well community. It is really neat. It's uh, LXC is all written in C. LXD is written in Golang. Surprise. I mean, uh, maybe not unsurprisingly. But it's it's now used for various backend systems uh, within Canonical's world, um, and a lot of this, again, like AppC, bubbled up into a conversation of all the needs, being able to discuss the design first, uh, and not just run off on a tangent to develop a feature or user experience without at least getting all the people that are involved on board. And it led into the uh, open container initiative uh, specifications. Initially, it was just one spec. It got split off into a runtime piece and an image format piece. Like, how would you pack it or get a content addressable nature about that image? Um, it took about two years for from the time that we formed the OCI to the time we had a, a version one of the runtime and image spec. Um, and only this year have we started the, the registry API, like how you can push those images around. Um, it's not reinventing the wheel there. It's leveraging what's already been done, but there's a lot of cruft in the Docker registry API that needs to be cleaned out. Um, and potentially new features added, like um, ways to even do like peer-to-peer -peer synchronization or chunking down and not using tar archives anymore. Uh, so that, that conversation will happen in the distribution spec. But so notably, 2017, when we, we finally stamped the V1 release of the image and the runtime spec, um, there were already expectations of how that, that kind of standardized layer would be accepted within the community. Um, Kubernetes had already been going. Like it, was start, it launched in 2014 um, with Rocket. It introduced conversations within Kubernetes of how adding additional container runtimes would, was really, really a pain, painful process. Um, when they, do, uh, Kubernetes was originally very, very Docker-centric. Uh, even to this day, we're still finding expectations that are very Docker-centric, and those are being worked through. There's fewer and fewer, but um, Rocket made a lot of that very evident. So in 2016, Kubernetes, rather than wholly going with just OCI, they, they, they made a container runtime interface. And almost in likeness, they have an image service and a runtime service. And it's a way to describe what they expect of any container runtime that will provide any kind of an image service. So you could actually have two different gRPC endpoints, one that just does image management and one that just does the execution lifecycle of those containers. Um, so far, I don't think anybody's really split that up. It's just one one entity, one gRPC socket will export both the image and runtime service. <clears throat> but the communication piece here is, is the, it's pulled straight from their website. Um, and so initially they, the migration when they introduced this gRPC uh, s s container runtime interface, they started migrating over to a Docker shim. And only in around Docker, uh, Kubernetes 1.8 was the migration complete where they weren't doing any side channel communications through o over to the, con to the Docker runtime. Um, for a long time, it was even pieces of like events from the container, whether or not pods were, were going up and down, uh, some, kind of, some of the pieces of the C group management, or resource management of the containers. These were all like 
side, side approaches to the container runtime. And it was only about 1.8 that they migrated everything over to the CRI or some other kind of side management piece like C Advisor or otherwise. Um, so, Cryo, and I, I didn't get a, I didn't go back in, in time far enough on Cryo, but Cryo was originally the OCI daemon, um, and there was contention on that name, <laughs> so it was forcibly renamed to CRIO for OCI. Um, but Cryo started in 2016 when the CRI came out. Like it w we were part of the conversation that got the CRI f framed up so that it could happen for other runtimes um, and has been only Kubernetes focused since that time. Um, it, it was defaulting to the run C for that last mile, uh, but that's configurable. Uh, and has been very interesting because since we were so early to that to that conversation and we weren't trying to tailor to every single use case, um, it allowed other projects to come on board. And I'll talk about a few of those uh, run C replacements in just a second. Um, <laughs> around, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on camera, but around like 20, late 2016, um, I was called into a meeting in California and effectively asked like a cease and desist to stop working on cryo, like formally shut the project down. Um, and with concessions to go in and try and make the container D part of Docker do those pieces instead. Um, and the political nonsense that it all was our request back, we're like, cool, we will, we will look at doing that if the Docker community can get rid of the BDFL model and go to a fully open governance. And there was, no, there, was a, there was a disconnect there. And so at that time was when the Docker community went full steam ahead and making their shim container D layer actually have user interface features and talk to not only the Docker daemon, but as well as having a, a CRI shim that could run on top of it. Um, and so those two have been kind of the informal competitors since then. Uh, but still to this day, Containerd accommodates several use cases, not just for the, CR, the Kubernetes CRI, uh, but now is, is another contender in that area. Um, and then Alibaba's pouch was announced about a year ago I think they've only been really pushing it in the last six months, but Alibaba's pouch is fascinating. I have only put hands on it insofar as to be kind of shocked, horrified, and amazed, but it, it, it imports from all, all the projects. Like it, it, it imports from Docker's lib network and the CNI. It, it, it imports from OCI, Docker, Run C, it can run as its own tool. It can also export a CRI. It can do regular pooling and pushing of images as well as it does a peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent backend for images. Um, it, they maintain that their system can run on RHEL 6 kernels. It uses KVM, all of it. <laughs> but it's, it's in the CRI layer as well. Um, and so like Antonio mentioned a few minutes ago, because so much of the conversation is now at that CRI layer and people are making these runtimes, there's a unified interface for it rather than all those tools having their own user interface tool. Uh, there's CRI Cuddle and it's, you can, you can interact with it, but it's largely a debugging tool. But I think this is, this is now where the conversation of like, how will you work underneath the Kubernetes stack or talk to the runtime is gonna be with the CRI uh, Cuddle. So real quick, um, since the 1.0 of the OCI image and runtime spec went out, there's been an abundance of these, these uh, runtimes, places that can drop in and replace. Um, largely the compatibility layer is that they know how to do certain life cycle steps and that they can read this JSON structure. It's not that complicated. The stupid part that is still being argued is the compatibility of the CLI. So at this point, all of these runtimes to be able to drop in and replace are conforming to what the Run C CLI behavior does. 
Um, it's dumb, but it's where it is. There's Oracle uh, introduced a rail car, which is written in Rust, nice, neat. Um, I don't know the particular benefits of using it, except for it's not written in Golang. Um, if you've heard about clear containers or Hyper-V from the Hyper-SH folks, both of those were using a, a some kind of a VM backend. Hyper-V could talk to VirtualBox and Zen and KVM and other stuff. Um, whereas the clear containers had focused only in QMU, those two projects came together and are now Kata containers. Um, yeah, it's it's good stuff. We've been working with them heavily because they've they have almost since the beginning clear containers and Alcata containers focus mostly on cryo to be able to run underneath Kubernetes. Um, and we've been working with them to get as many of their patches for the kernel inside the client upstreamed because they had some improvement, you know, some optimizations for the guest kernel as well as they had made their own machine type in QMU to buy it, to, to pass pass over like posting and all kinds of BIOS pieces to make it as fast as possible, I'm trying to get all that upstream. But that's there. Nabla containers is kind of a unikernel approach. Neat. It's got some security features, but you have to tailor your your container image. It actually has to have like an executor that's shoved into the image that can help your container run. So they have like some Node.js examples, but it's a run C drop in replacement. Uh, NVIDIA, NVIDIA now has a fork of Run C. It is a straight up fork of Run C, but it does all kinds of like GPU and CUDA optimized pieces so that you can do more containery things with NVIDIA and not have to hack the shit out of that last mile. Um, Google has GVisor. You can use it in a non Run C replacement kind of way, but they have a Run C drop in replacement. Um, it's it's more general purpose than Nabla. It has some KVM offload, but it's largely a syscall emulation layer. Um, it will probably capture like 80% of your use case. Um, so Windows now has a drop-in replacement. This is how uh, some of the communities have had Windows native support, was calling to this Windows H HSC, the host computing service shim layer. But now they have a run C drop-in replacement so that they can be shelled out to. And I have a feeling that they're also going to be working on and announce their own CRI replacement as well. We would talk to them about using Cryo, but and, and they had worked with ContainerD for a little while, and I think they were fed up with re-architecting them, so they're going to probably do their own. All right, so then lastly, there's also a list of community pieces that were either wrappers on, like, Flatpak has bubble wrap for the limited user containers. There's a bubble wrap wrapper. Um, Inspawn, uh, I had made an Inspawn wrapper, don't use it. Um, there's a minimal C runtime here, there's a community project here. Uh, since June, Leonard has actually started a native support for the OCI runtime in Inspawn. Uh, there's a few pieces missing, it needs testing and review, but that's a neat approach that rather than some of the pieces, you could just swap that out and it would be more integrated into the full system stack. We've done most of the footwork of that in Run C already, but it's nice to have options. So that's that. Um, and then all this has already been covered, but it's in the slide deck for reference. Uh, other options that are now since things have gotten popular, uh, build a Podman Scopio, you've already heard mentioned. Uh, another one, this is terrible color scheme, I'm sorry, but UMOCI uh, is a project from SUSE, uh, and it helps you manage the OCI image format. So it's pretty useful when you can use Scopio to pull down an image. Uh, emoji, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Emoji to unpack the image, and then you can use Run C, Railcar, whatever, to run the image. So if you're doing debugging of that yourself, you can use Scopio and Emochi together to do that. Um, and that's it. So that's this talk. Um, you can go to that address and see these slides already. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I have like 30 seconds. I don't know if we have enough time for questions. Anybody have a question they want to shoot out on that history real quick? Nothing. Crickets. See me later. <laughs>